in terms of approaching a BHI uh, proponent, how might we use a presuppositional approach? I mean, we kind of unpacked it as to how what that would look like in terms of approaching Islam. Um, what are the similarities in that approach with BHI? What does that look like when, in terms of engaging some of their specific argumentation? Let me um, give what may be, just like in apologetics, 1 Peter 3.15 is like the key verse, and presuppositionalist uh, thought, sometimes you have the verse in Colossians about the treasures of wisdom in Christ, or maybe in Proverbs about don't answer, do answer, you know, the fool. I think when we deal with these comparative religions that in some way borrow more explicitly heavily from Christian authority, uh, Jesus, the Bible, I think the key verse is probably Deuteronomy 32, 31, for mm. their rock is not as our rock. Their rock is not as our rock. Now, this is, of course, um, in Deuteronomy, in the context I'm not claiming is something to do with presuppositional apologetics, but the principle applies. And let me show you how Bonson used it. This is a quote from Bonson's article, uh, Presuppositionalism and False, False Faith. Here's what he said, quote, by internally examining the worldview which is offered by whatever religious devotee is having the dialogue with him, the that's how we uh, that's how we deal with the false faith. Step one: the formal fact that the opposing religionist speaks of God or gods is not a difficulty here, for they must define their specific concept of deity. Remember here the example of Scripture, where their rock is not as our rock, Deuteronomy 32, 31. Recall the devastating prophetic critique of the heathen's lifeless idols, which are contradictorily under the sovereignty of those who bow down to them. The use of religious vocabulary and appeals does not change the applicability of the indirect method of disproving your opponent's presuppositions. And so when it comes to Hebrew Islamism, for example, almost all of it is non-Trinitarian. And so... That means they're not dealing with the God of the Bible at that point. And so if you reject the Trinity, you're not worshiping the God of the Bible. Jesus is the Messiah. If you're Hebrews like who rejects Jesus as the Messiah, you're not dealing with the God of the Bible because that's the promised Messiah that's spoken of in the talk, Tanakh. Mm -hmm. Emmanuel, God with us, image of the invisible God, the eternal creator who has always existed as the Son and the Word. If you reject that about Jesus, you have another Jesus. The God of the Bible is not a racial supremacist. If your version of God is a racial supremacist, like a lot of Hebrews lights, you're not describing the God of the Bible. And so what we do is when Hebrews light says, we believe in this book, not this book, but the Bible they'd be holding <laughs> up, right? Um, what we do is we do compare and contrast. We get a lot more into the actual content of what they say and then take some of their presuppositions, no matter how ludicrous they may be and find out if they can really work. And that's maybe what I'll get into next, but I want to make sure that we're where we need to be with everything. And sure. And, so, uh, so, so that. let's take a common. So, so if you, if, if you are a black Hebrew Israelite and you are standing on the street corner and I'm walking by and I'm, I'm like, Hey, you know, I see you guys kind of uh, saying some weird stuff, you know, how could I approach them in terms of like a conversation? What would that look like? What, how should I start off um, with a, in a conversation with, with, a, uh, with one of those guys? I mean, I'm always just going to probably say something like, can you tell me what the gospel is? Mm, tell me okay. what the gospel is. Now, if they're out on the street, you know what they'll do a lot of times? They'll go to uh, Luke 4, where Jesus is in the synagogue. Okay. And then they'll say, look, he's quoting... In Luke 4, Isaiah 61, which is true so far. Right? And then they'll say, well, let's see what Isaiah 61 says. And then they'll read the rest of Isaiah 61, the parts he didn't quote, and they'll interpret some of those parts of Isaiah 61 as saying that non-Israelites will have to be slaves of Israelites in the kingdom. And so they'll say the gospel basically is slavery. The gospel wow. is that that's what the, that's what some of the one westers will do when you get into the gospel. So it's good news for them, bad news for the Edomite. So the Edomite in their worldview is the so-called white man. Now remember, these are only the street corner guys. These are one west Hebrew Israelites. I'm talking about because you said on the street. I'm talking about mm -hmm. those kind of guys. Not all Hebrew Israelites believe what I'm saying here. So presuppositionally, how would we use that against them? Say, okay, so you believe that descendants of Esau, Edomites are who the world now calls the white men. 
Now, it's going to be hard to ha- to, for this to happen in a street situation. And by the way, most of them know the verse I'm going to turn to. But are you able to type in, Eli, yep. Deuteronomy 23.7? Yes. So this is where it gets kind of presuppositional. And this is just a basic example. 20, 23 um, what? Deuteronomy 23.7. So here's the beliefs of the, of the one West Hebrews light. We believe the Bible is the word of God. We got to follow the law. And... Edomites are the white man, and we're going to enslave them in the kingdom, and they can't yeah. be in the kingdom as anything but slaves. Okay, so now look at Deuteronomy 23.7. What's it say? Um, it says, you shall not loathe an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not loathe an Egyptian, because you are a stranger in his land. And then keep on going when we're we'll look at 8, verse 8. Okay, I didn't have the... The whole oh, thing sorry. is just the, the one portion there. So let me get to a <laughs> let me get to a, a one that allows me to move. Okay, um, is it twenty three actually? Twenty three eight. Well, while you're doing that, so notice what he said so far, and you'll get the next verse. Check it out. The Edomite is your brother, so we're using their presuppositions to get them against them. Most of those guys talking you out on the street corner, by any meaningful definition of the word, are not Israelites. They are only Israelites if you want to put it in air quotes, which I usually do. However, they assume they're Israelites. Okay, so that means this word, this command that they say they hold and Christians don't is directly to their ancestors. What does it say? It says, don't abhor, don't despise, don't hate the Edomite. He's your brother. So... That means, according to one West versions of Hebrew Islamism, every white guy they see walking down the street that they say is going to change, that's their brother. And they can't abhor him. Now, what does that abhor have to do with? It doesn't just mean don't dislike. It actually has to do with don't view them as ultimately ceremonially unclean before God. And the reason why I would use that type of language is for the very next line. So this has to do with Edomites and Egyptians that in some way are associated with the congregation uh, as far as, uh, or I'll say the nation, I'll say the nation of Israel. I, I have the scripture if you, whenever now, you want me to read it. Yeah, look at, look at 23.8. What's it say? Uh, 23.8 says, the sons of the third generation who are born to them may enter the assembly of the Lord. So, True or false, Hebrew Israelite, Edomite grandchildren can be in the congregation of Yahweh. True or false? The answer is true. Deuteronomy 23 explicitly says their grandchildren can enter into the assembly. The assembly of the Lord or the congregation of Yahweh means that you're fully able to participate in covenant life with Israel. Because this isn't random Edomites. This isn't Edomites living down in what later be called a Dumia. And they're just saying, hey, you guys, after you have some kids, you can join. Jo- These are, in some way, they're around them. Don't abhor them because that's your brother. There's a reason given for this command by Yahweh. And then it goes on to say, in fact, they can enter into the congregation of the assembly of the Lord. Now, what do they do with that? Their answers are always horrible. The old one they used to use is they had a stock phrase. Then they would simply say that was a clerical error. I have a whole video. If you go to my YouTube channel and type in the phrase clerical error, you'll find that they misunderstood a notation on a lexicon and actually literally got it backwards about what the clerical error was. So it's not true. Now, some of them have caught on to that, and they'll say things like, well, it changed after that. They'll they, they give these horrible that, that don't explain why they still would say they hate white people because we're not assuming Edomites are white people. That's actually ridiculous. But if they were and they're Israelites, how can they say we follow the law and yet we do the opposite of Deuteronomy 23 7 because they would say they hate the white man? Not only that, can you go to Genesis 25 25? Now, I don't know if you have a comment on that, but to me, that's very presuppositional and it's an example of using what they say and then showing how it conflicts with something else they say and ultimately what scripture says genesis what genesis 25 25 because this now will get into the rationale for why they say edomites are actually white people it's going to get into their their what they say is their rationale go ahead i got it so uh now the first came forth red all over like a hairy garment and they named him esau so they'll say 
What happens if you slap a white person? What happens if a white person is out in the sun? They turn red. So they're really the, not the, they're not really the white man. They're the red man. And so that's how you know. And a lot of them are hairy. So this is their evidence that Edomites are white people, right? Okay. Now, do you know anyone else who has described the same way in the Bible that Esau is described as in the in as far as the Hebrew word goes. Well, I'll show you. Can you go to first Samuel 16 12? Okay. First Samuel 16 12, please. And I want to show you this. So remember, Hebrews is the light that says, Hey, Esau's white man is really the red man. They would misuse Genesis 25, 25 okay. for that. And then they're gonna go. Uh, to Genesis 25, 25. And the red there is sometimes translated as ruddy. Mm. It's the same same word we're talking about there, red or ruddy. The Hebrew word is the same in both places. But can you read First Samuel 16, 12? 16, 12. Mm -hmm. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. So who's that talking about there in the context? Uh, who's the he? Babe? Is this David? That's David. So David is described using the same exact word that uh, Moses ultimately is the final editor used to describe Esau in Genesis 25, 25. And sometimes it's translated red. Sometimes it's translated rud ruddy, but it's the same word. So what will we do with that? Because if it means that he's a white man, and that's what it's saying there with, with David, then what does it mean for Esau? How is it different for Esau versus David? And if you're wondering, well, okay, what is the word there? It's admoni. Admoni is, is the word. Do you have Lagos or something up there? You see what I'm saying? I don't have Lagos up. No, okay, okay, that's fine. I just wanted to see if you could. I had to remove it from my desktop because it takes so much space. <laughs> it does. But the Hebrew word, everyone, is admoni, which can be red or ruddy. And you, you can look this up. So everyone, understand. David, for the Hebrew Israelite, who's a one Wester, would be viewed as their ancestor. And usually, uh, according to the 12 tribes chart that the street guys use, if you're so-called black, as they would put it, it means you're part of the tribe of Judah. All right. So if you're Judah, that means David would be an ancestor in a certain sense, or at least part of your same tribe. All right. So he's described as red or ruddy. Esau is described the same way. So how is it that David is your black Israelite ancestor, but Esau is the red white man's ancestor. Hmm. The same word for their physical appearance here. Usually they'll say something like, well, you've never been to, been to a black reunion. I got a cousin who has a red tent. And so you just don't know what you're talking about. Okay. That's actually, by the way, not, not that far off from the truth. This ruddy, this admoni from what I've, because I've looked into this lexically, it appears that it's essentially describing the reddish tint or tinge that brown gets mm. so it's like the red heifer people talk about the red heifer that's a real thing or the colors of certain horses where it's brown with this kind of only way to describe it would be like a reddish tint yeah. well some people have that that's true but you can't not make it apply to esau and then have it apply to david and it probably doesn't have anything to do with your cousin at the barbecue either to be honest so so when you look at this you're like okay this is arbitrary this is clearly inconsistent, and it also exposes the lie you say you hold up to Scripture, and you say you interpret it properly, but we just gave you two examples that are very foundational to One West Israelism that show that you don't. One more, if you could like. One more, if you'd like. Oh, one other thing is, well, man, I'm, I'll go. Uh, one well, more. Before do, you continue, yeah. I just want to point out if people are getting, uh, people are following, the presuppositional nature of what you're doing is that you are hypothetically granting the truth of their perspective and then examining their perspective on their own presuppositions. And right. the way that you're doing that vocab is that you're going to scriptures that they accept and that they use. Right. That that's part of the what we call. We can now can look at the presuppositional framework and use the presuppositional language you are doing what what we call an internal critique so he might be speaking about specific texts and you're like well wait how does presuppositionalism relate to that it does because the he's using text that they agree on in their own perspective and then showing on its own base um those those passages don't serve 
uh, the purposes that they want it to serve. So you're doing. Can I show you one more? Here. Can you go yeah, to go Song, go Solomon five ten? You know, I was like, you know, let's just sort of rub it in here. Song of Solomon five ten. This one is. <laughs> it's, this one is. This one is very fascinating. I think here. Five ten. Yeah, five ten. All right. It says here, my beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among ten thousand. Now, what should we do with that? What should we do with that? If we're taking these, uh, if we're taking this the way a Hebrew Israelite would take it, is this is this, <laughs> white and ruddy? What do we do with this, guys? Okay, now look. Uh, I don't think it's saying that um, it's like what we'll call like literally white. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's what it's saying from my understanding. And that's why the ESV, which is funny because they'll usually, not always, but one West is usually prefer the KJV over something like the ESV. Okay. The ESV gets it better here in the English. It says, my beloved is radiant and ruddy. Mm. That's what that's trying to describe. But if they're going to claim, well, the KJV, da, 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 and this is the she talking. So she's talking about Solomon here. She's talking about, my beloved is radiant and ruddy. So looks like his dad, daddy David and looks like Esau, and he's radiant. But if we're going to go to the KJV and we're going to take these physical descriptions without any kind of greater understanding, clearly then so Solomon would be a white guy. And guess what? Mm. The Anglo-Israelites and the Christian identity people use that exact verse to try to prove that Solomon, therefore the Jews, were white. Mm. So two could play at this game, but it shows the – a simplistic and incorrect program that they're on to try to discover because just using logic, when we apply logic, which Christianity provides the, the ability for this, us to do this, um, even saying Solomon was black, let's say he was, he was black. Def definitely. That in no way proves that the person speaking is, is black or is right. an Israelite. Let's just say Psalms an Israelite. He's black. Therefore I'm black. Therefore I'm an Israelite. That's not even lot that doesn't even that doesn't right. work. It it's definitely doesn't prove you're related to them. Right. But it, it wouldn't prove because even on their own worldview, and I'm gonna use it against them again, I'm using one Westers now. One Westers believe black Hamites sold them who are black Semites into slavery. So what I mean is on the continent, you have some people who would be there as descendants of Ham and people who came from the outside during the diaspora, who are the Israelites who in some way may appear to an outsider to look like them, but they're not. And that's why the Hamites sold the Semites into slavery. My mm. point is, even on the One West Hebrew Israelite schema, Eli, they have it where certain black people are Hamites and therefore Gentiles. And that's why you can find a video that I have where I ask a Hebrew Israelite if he believes in the future he's going to own black slaves. And he said yes, because – the Africans would be Gentiles, descendants of Ham, whereas they think that they're descendants of Shem. See? Mm. So my point by saying that is even under their own schema, black being black is not enough to be an Israelite if you're talking about one Westers. So this is using all this stuff against them. And in fact, when you say, you know, your views are anti-Semitic, they'll say, I'm Semitic. How can I be anti-Semitic, right? Now, there's a lot of problems with that. But remember, who do they think Jacob is? That's a descendant of the Israelites. Esau's the descendant of the Edomites. These one Westers would admit that they hate white people, but they think white people under the one West rubric are Semites too. So you can be a Semite and be anti-Semitic, according to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> so all the stuff I'm saying, I know it's a little technical, this and that. And some of these guys are like, oh, we've heard this. Oh, this is dumb. I'm talking about Hebrew Israelites who might watch this. Sure. The thing is, though, they don't actually give good answers. On the street, if a guy's got a microphone, he can outdo you. On the internet, he brings you on his channel. He can mute you and drop you off. And these are the things we've seen happen a lot. But as far as answering fact to fact, you'll find that almost always, there's exceptions, the Isra Hebrews like proponent falls short. And mm. so we are Vantillian evidentialists. The closer the worldview looks or purports to look in some way like Christian Christianity, and some Hebrews lights get pretty close as far as a biblical, a bit more biblical worldview, it gets more into these 
evidences and looks a little bit more like evidentialism to the outsider. And that's because, as I heard, uh, again, a guy from the Reform Forum say, if you pick a leaf off the tree, it's not like it's not part of the tree. You just picked up that leaf, but it goes down to the root of the tree. That's how we should view as preceptors evidences. The leaves on the end of the tree are evidences. Oh, look, look at this. The divine name was Yahweh. When you go to the oldest inscription in hieroglyphics that that speaks about uh, these Israelites, when I say oldest inscription, I mean the oldest inscription to contain the name Yahweh. You look at it, and uh, this Egyptian king, because at that time Sudan was part of Egypt, this Egyptian king describes the Israelites as the nomads of Yahweh, but in hieroglyphs. But it's in the hieroglyphs that it's saying Yahweh. Hmm. What's my point by saying that? That's a factual thing, an evidential thing, because almost all Hebrew sites deny that God's name could be Yahweh. They'll say that's a Yiddish interpretation, and they'll say it's either Yah- Yahweh or Yahuwah or something like that, or Yah, which is somewhat true because that's a shortened form. So Yah is sure. okay, but it's still not the complete name of the Tetragrammatron that was being written, albeit without the vowels. And so we can go and say, well, look. Even the Egyptians knew way back then, and I tweeted about this two days ago, by the way. So if someone wants more, you can actually see the restored, uh, the restore, uh, you can see it restored and everything. We can see what I'm talking about. And I talk about where it is. I think the place is called Soleb. That's evidential. So you're getting into someone says, I believe in the Bible, but Yahweh was never his name. Okay. Evidence. So that's the, that's the leaf at the end of the tree we're looking at that at that point. But it's okay to look at the leaves of the tree. And we're still going to go back to these foundational things and ultimately show them that they're idolaters because right. they don't believe Jesus is God. They don't believe God is triune. And a lot of these guys are getting more explicit that they themselves are gods in the same way Jesus is God. But I just said that they say Jesus isn't God. Well, they'll say he's created, but they believe they share his godhood because they believe that all Israelite males are gods. Now, again, this is a one West interpretation, but I could show you image of an image, especially IUIC puts ye are gods and they'll show themselves with like balls of fire, like a Dragon Ball Z type thing, because they believe they're going to gain spiritual powers in the kingdom. So huh. I know that's really getting lost in the weeds. What's my point? Their rock is not like our rock. They'll mm. say believe in the God of the Bible, but they're not talking about the God of the Bible. The Christians got to go to great lengths to try to show that, especially since one of the least interesting topics to most Hebrew Israelites is the nature of God. They're more interested in the physical description of Israelites, which is mm. something that is not explicitly talked about, very difficult to ascertain, and it's not even all across the board anyway. And also sure. there's the issue of after 2,000 years of dispersion, people don't look the same. They go through Europe, they go through Africa, they kind of come out looking like their neighbors. This is all just facts of history, but that's what you got to get into with these guys. But here's what I'm saying, everyone. That's still presuppositional. Uh, and right. and we start with the basic essence, essence of nonetheless, they're idol worshipers. Let me read one paragraph here. Sure. The God whom Nathaniel of IUIC talks about is not real. The God whom Ben Ami wrote about will never be. This is from an upcoming blog I have next Wednesday. The God whom Tahar of GMS makes videos about has never existed. The God whom Hulan Mitchell himself, he believed he was God. He called himself Yahweh ben Yahweh, of the nation of Yahweh lectured about is not a God at all, but rather an idol. The God whom Edward Meredith Bibbins, the founder of One Westism, taught about on the streets is a God of his own design. The God whom General Yohanna of UPK shouts about is not a God. The God whom Wentworth Matthew spoke about is not the God of the Tanakh. The God whom Ariase gave him visions, did no such thing because that God is not even there to communicate with Arya. The God whom F.S. Cherry used to scream about in Philly is not a God. The God who told Jermaine Grant he was the God sent comforter did not tell him that because there was not a God there to speak to him because that God doesn't exist. Hebrew Israelites have God wrong. Mm. And so to me, that's a presupposition uh, element is recognizing that and proceeding from that. And I do think that goes in line with things that Van Til and Bonson wrote about, because sure. as again, as he said, when we do worldview apologetics, we compare the actual content of our worldview with the actual content of the worldview presented by our friends. In this I'd case, say that again, the actual content. Yeah, that means the data. So yep. it's not, I mean, when people say, oh, well, all of this stuff is evidentialism. Presuppositionalists don't use evidence. I mean, page Van, 152. Yeah. Page, and yeah. there's a whole book, Van Til, and the use of evidence. It's not, this is, 
this isn't like new stuff. I mean, Van Til wasn't against evidence. We shouldn't be either, and we should be able to master the evidence as well as the framework that gives meaning and content to that that specific data. Yeah, and so I just want to point that out to people. And Bonson, again, now he was talking about Islam, but when I read this little sentence here, I'm sure. going to replace Islam with Hebrewism. On page 153 of the same book, he said, all we need to do is show conflicts between what the Bible teaches and what Hebrewism teaches. Now, he said Islam, but what he's saying is there, you're holding up uh, op opposing, you know, uh, here's their claim, but here's something that opposes their own claim. And even on a morality level, Check this out. When it comes to One West Hebrew Islamism, where they believe they're going to enslave other nations eternally, where some of them believe you can lie to outsiders, hmm. that shows their God. And I've just established he's not, there's no God at all. It's an idol product of their own imagination or desires. Their God is not the basis for moral morality or ethics because their God doesn't say slavery is wrong. He doesn't say that beating your slaves is wrong. He just says the right people have to be cracking the whip. Mm. And so that's why when some of these guys criticize antebellum slavery, I'll preface it by saying, yes, I agree. But why are you saying it's wrong? Right. Now, again, I'm talking about the more radical, harder edge ethnocentric guys. This is not identical with all of them. Someone will say, well, I don't believe that. I don't, I don't think we should own people. Da, 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 da. Now, they still have a soft ethnic hierarchy, but I'm pointing out some ways, and that's why you got to ask the questions. But we're not going to be able to get into today, but I've mentioned the 12 tribes chart. I have a whole blog that does a presuppositional internal critique against can the 12 you, tribes can chart. Can you tell folks, vocab, where your blog is? How, how yeah, can people get the to the blog? squad.com the okay. shield squad.com and, and the article is called thought provoking questions to dismantle the 12 tribes chart. I don't know if you allow me to do links in here, but I can drop it in there. Yeah. Drop the link. And I see, um, here is there's a sign in does, do people have to sign up for it in order to access the content? Uh, I think that's like, they're trying to get you to subscribe. It doesn't cost or anything like that. I think it's cause the, I don't know if you have to sign in to read it, but I know they're trying to get people to subscribe, but it's all free, but you can support it and pay. I actually don't, I don't actually know. How does it work? Can you look at it without signing in everyone? Let me know. I don't, I don't actually know. It says here. I think you can. I can think you can hit no thanks where it says. Oh yeah. In. Yeah. I see here. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to subscribe. I just wanted to see the other, I see the, okay. I see all the articles. Put out an article a week. Nice. Article. And, uh, and the next one is actually going to be about this topic. It's going to be uh, titled, <clears throat> let me see here, Presuppositionalism as Applied to Hebrewism. Mm. And a lot of it's going to be introductory. So, you know, I'm glad we got to do this interview today because what I want to yeah. do is continue to develop this and go farther and farther. And even if sometimes people say, well, that doesn't look very presuppositional. Presuppositionalism is more stark because the contrast is more stark right. when dealing with like materialists. That's true. And I appreciate some of the criticism of evidentialists. It's like, well, you guys sometimes just theorize and don't do the work. So I'm right. sensitive to that, and I agree. So I'm trying to say, well, here's the foundation. I know I'm not always consistent, uh, but here's what I'm trying to do. This is the mentality I'm seeking to 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 have and promote and all that. And I'm I'm trying to be faithful in it. But uh, then a lot of times it gets into just looking at the evidence. And that is part of presuppositionalism. Sure. <laughs> I like the leaves and, and on the tree point, idea. You know, we were the talking leaves about this, part of the tree. We were talking about this the other day that when a presuppositionalist is talking about evidences and an evidentialist is talking about evidences, if you walked at, in the middle of that conversation or that discussion, it's going to look like they're saying a lot of similar things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, presuppositionalism is a very different methodology, but that doesn't mean that we're always saying things that are completely different than the evidentialist or the classicalist. And then, and, and that's okay. You know, if someone were to walk up to me in the middle of the street and say, you know, what's, what evidence is there for the Bible? Well, I'm not going to necessarily start with, well, well, how can you account for evidence to begin with? Like, no, we can go to the specific evidences and, and perhaps later on the presuppositions will come into play. And sometimes they won't, you know, if, if, right. If, if you give yeah. the evidence and someone's like, man, I never thought about that. That's really cool. Thank you. And you're not gonna be like, but wait, I'm not done. I need to whip out my transit. No, that's not how it works. So, yeah. um, so yeah, I just wanted to get that piece out there. Agree. And, you know, preceptors, I think do need to be more uh, practical 
you know, I'm not necessarily saying pragmatic, but practical and tactical, tact, tactical yeah. and factual, getting out there and saying, well, da da da. da. And, you know, uh, James White debated a Hebrew Israelite on his program twice. It was a guy named Elder Rakov, UCC. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he would say he's a presuppositionalist. Now, I know sometimes people have criticized him. He's not. And I think that's just maybe they don't understand what presuppositionalism is. Mm -hmm. And you'll see a lot of the discussion had to do with facts and data and evidence. And I think uh, he did a great job as far as approaching it from that approach. And uh, that's kind of what it could look like, you know, yeah. it could look like that. And the debate wasn't that much different than Michael Brown's recent debate with the Hebrews light mm -hmm. as far as some elements go. And I understand Brown's not a pre supper. I'm not saying that he is, but I'm saying when you get into those evidences, some of it's going to look like, okay, you'll see it. And some of that's the fault of presuppositionalists. Maybe we've spent so much time and trying to show how these things are different and then talk about, you know, the models and the methods that sometimes people haven't seen the similarities and then seeing uh, people do it. And I understand I'm not a thought leader of presuppositionalism. So I'm just some guy talking about it. You know, I don't have David Bonson's phone number like you do, but I, the, I don't I have the email, <laughs> but I'm just I've saying, I never spoke to him on the phone or anything. I okay. just happened. To, it was Give a it connection. I, I know a guy yeah. who knows a guy. I, Give it time. Give it time. Give it yeah. time. But no, but I'm just saying that that's m still my understanding, and, and, and I and I'm glad to be able to share it here today. Hopefully, in a helpful way. Yeah, uh, we'll be dropping more on this in the future, little by little, over the years. If God allows me to stick around. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. Well, I've been talking to Vocab Malone, the street apologist, and he has been sharing with us the how to apply a presuppositional approach to uh, the Black Hebrew Israelite movement. And um, hopefully um, you guys are encouraged by some of the things he has to say. I mean, yeah, to defend the faith, you're going to have to know Scripture, especially if the other side affirms portions of Scripture that's going to, um, you know, really require you to get down on the mat and kind of deal with the ins and outs of what a text is and what it means and the context and all that kind of stuff. So thank you so much for, for everything that you're doing on that front um, vocab. Been driving all along.